what I first want to talk about on your timeline is Farnham and your experience with Farnham and how you got the gig and uh, then how you developed during your time on that gig. Because I, when you started that, you're a very different player to you are now. And I want to know yeah. what influenced that. So how did you get that gig? Um, I, you know, the letter is just sitting up there because unfortunately John's longtime manager and friend, Glenn Wheatley, just passed away last week from COVID. And uh, Glenn had been, uh, he had some health issues and I think COVID, he caught COVID and that was just the thing that just pushed him, pushed him over the edge, unfortunately. So uh, whereas a person who was fitter and healthier might have overcame it, it overcame him, unfortunately. But I've got this letter up there because we were all approached uh, as members of John's band, we were approached by some people who wanted to do a documentary about John for Netflix. And, um, and we're all pretty excited about being part of that. And I, I just emailed Glenn a, like a, about 10 days ago. And I said, I've still got the letter you sent me all those years ago, 1985 it was, in October of 1985. And uh, I said, I'm gonna take the letter down and show it to the documentary people. They might get a kick out of it. They might be able to use a screenshot of it or something. And um, because I was trying to figure out the timeline of when I got the gig and and all the rest of it, because I'd always been a fan of John Farnham's. Like, I mean, you, I, I'd known about John from, it would have been from the late 60s. I mean, he was a fan. He, uh, he was a, <laughs> he, a fan. He was a, uh, I recently did a Patreon video where I said Richie Blackmore was a big fan of mine. I mean, I'm just all over it, you know, just <laughs> bloody word salad, you know. But um, I, uh Everyone knew about John. He was a massive pop star during the 60s and then had an evolution through the 70s where he did theatre work and also even had a TV show. He had like a, a sitcom that he did, a regular TV show. So he's just done it all. And then he joined the Little River Band and uh, I really loved the album. The first album he did with them was called The Net and I just loved that album. I've always been a fan of Little River Band and, and uh, when John joined, I was even an even bigger fan. And in, I, I tried to work out the timeline and I eventually, eventually figured it out. And I think it was about 1982 or 83. Uh, there's this big car race in Australia called the Bathurst 1000, which stands for a thousand kilometres. And one in 1982 or 83 or whenever it was, might have been 82, me and my friends decided to drive all the way. It was like an eight hour drive to get to this car race and uh, bought tickets and everything. It was just a drink fest really but I mean we, we were fans of car racing and all that sort of stuff being the little petrol heads we were and as it turns out that year we went there they decided they were going to have concerts and the very first band to appear there was a the little river band and if you bought a ticket to the race you got a ticket to the gig and I thought well this will be fun I'm keen to see if this guy can actually sing this stuff live because I tried singing and one of the main things you always look for are power range that sort of stuff and Farnham just had unlimited capacity in all those aspects. And I was fascinated to see if he could pull, if he could pull it off live because what he was doing on the albums was really impressive. And so I got to this gig and quickly realised that what he was doing in the studios was holding back. Like he was the first singer I'd ever seen that obliterated what he did in the studios in a live setting. I've been to all these heavy metal concerts where the singer was out of breath and holding the microphone out of the crowd and all the rest of it. <laughs> None of that with Farnham. He was just killing it, absolutely killing it. I'd never seen or heard anything like it. And uh, so years later, I just took this initiative to send out tapes because uh, I'd been working as a plumber. That was my trade, my apprenticeship and everything. We, we just got apprenticeships around here. That's what we did. And I, there was a gig as a plumber going, so I thought, oh, I'll do that. So that's what I did. And... Uh, I, I just decided it's time to start looking a fur, further afield, see if I can get into a cover band maybe. That'd be fun. Like get in a cover band in Melbourne, which was the nearest big city, and just pay my bills doing that. That'd be awesome. So I just managed to find a few uh, names and addresses of uh, management companies, record companies, and just sent out a whole bunch of cassettes that I recorded, demos of me playing drums, bass, everything. They were pretty, mm -hmm. pretty bad. But I threw them out there, handwritten letters, cassette in the mail, the bag, the whole thing. And um, most of the record companies replied with thanks, but no thanks because they were unsolicited, unsolicited material. And that's fair enough. But I, th I think I sent two cassettes to management companies, one of which was the Wheatley organization. The other man management company said thanks, but no thanks. 
And I got Glenn's letter, the one that's sitting up there on my uh, studio speaker. And it said, Dear Brett, I just got your tape. Please call me. And I thought, well, this has got to be good. So I called him up. And this was in October of 1985. And he said, look, I am loved your tape. And he said, uh, I'm putting together a pub band for John Farnham. He wants to go out and do some gigs just to keep his, keep his, uh, keep his game up while Little River Band are having a hiatus. And do you want to tour with him? And I was just, you know, fumbling with the phone. <laughs> and I said, yeah, sure, that'd be awesome. So, so yeah, within a few weeks, I was going down to uh, meet John and uh, met him at his house, went in there, and the, he and his producer, Ross Fraser, were working on a song called Let Me Out. And it was uh, for a proposed album, which was going to happen next year, they told me. And they said, just blow a couple of solos on it. Let's see what you do. And, uh, and so uh, I took a couple of solos, got lucky, didn't hit any clangers, and uh, they liked <laughs> what I did. And the cool thing was we're in just John's lounge room he's at his house. And it's like 11 in the morning. You know, he probably hasn't even had his second coffee. And, uh, and they said, what would you do in the verses? And I said, well, I, I don't know. There's no vocal on it. There's, I don't know what I'd do in the verses. And John said, oh, I'll chuck a vocal on it for you. So he grabbed like a 58 <laughs> and just sang the thing. The, the song that's on the album was in F sharp. That was the basic key of the song. This version was in A. I remember it because it put the solos in very strange keys. And so he was hitting like G's. Like I'm talking, uh, what, uh, 15th fret on your high E string? Those kind of G's. Full voice, full chest voice, in his lounge room, no warm up. And I'm just sitting there going, you've got what? You know, I'm just sitting there going, oh my God, who is this guy? And, and um, just knocks, puts a vocal down that Robert Plant would have sold his soul for. I mean, and just, yeah, that'll do. And I think I was so blown away. I didn't know what to play in the verses, but they gave me the gig anyway. So we went out and did a, did a quick pub tour, three weeks around Christmas time of, of 85. And, and uh, I just, I made more money doing that than I made plumbing. Even just in that three week period, they were paying me more per week. I thought, gee, I hope this is the future because I really like it. And, uh, and luckily the next year, about uh, June of next year, uh, we did the Whispering Jack album. And um, they didn't really know what was going to happen with that. And it was such a unique situation because a lot of people I spoke to, John was 35 at this time, and uh, they didn't really know what was going to happen. But, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Dessert has arrived. Look at this. What a, what a, place. What a place I live in. This is the rock star life, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you. And, um, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of other musicians I spoke to, I said, yeah, I just did an album with John Farnham. And they said, oh, look, no one deserves it more. But really, I mean, you know, it's not going to happen, is it? You know? And the thing came out and, man, it just went ballistic. It, I think to this day it is still the highest selling album in Australian history. Wow. Yeah, isn't that wild? Yeah, it's Absolutely. amazing. And, that, like, uh, and we're talking, this is your first album you've played on right you've, you've not done yeah. any releases before first that. time i'd ever been first time i'd ever been in an actual proper recording studio <laughs> that wasn't the four track studio owned by our little local radio station here so and it, it sold over a million copies which to put into perspective australia's own back then australia only had 23 million people in it so i mean for an album to go to go um, that's not platinum a platinum was 150,000 copies here in mm -hmm. proportion to the population. So yeah, you're talking bigger than Thriller, you're talking bigger than Rumours, bigger than everything, really. It's a, yeah. It was an absolute phenomenon. It was the most amazing thing to be a part of. So, my, you know, never, never <laughs> be afraid to just go for the gold. You might just get it, and I, I actually did. Well, yeah, I mean, so before you sent off that, that tape, what was your gigging experience? Had you done circuits, but had you been playing live much, or was this just... <laughs> My gigging experience was a pub band with my cousins playing within about a, oh, sorry, the texts are coming in, um, <laughs> playing within about a 40, 40, 50 kilometre radius of this little town I'm in, which has a population, back then had a population of about 5,000, now it's grown to about 20,000, but uh, that was my gigging experience, just local pub band. Wow. Um, Nuts, so man. I've got a, a relevant question, but before we go on to that, would you recommend a couple of tracks for someone who wanted to hear like displays of your guitar work on Farnham's track specifically? Where, what tunes would you recommend they check out? There's some interesting ones. Um, well, I guess the, the, 
the sort of iconic one on the Whispering Jack album is, is that song, Let Me Out, where I get to blow a fair bit. There's some really good solos on, um, on an album called Chain Reaction, and there's a song on there called In Your Hands, which has some pretty wild stuff on it. Yeah, there's, a, there's another song on there on that Chain Reaction album called uh, New Day, I think, and it features another, a fantastic guitar player named Phil Buckle, who was in a band called Southern Sons here in Australia and his fellow guitar player Jack Jack Jones a lot of guitar players know of, of Jack and uh, uh, Phil ended up playing a pretty pivotal role in my life as well because I got to meet him long before I joined John's band he ended up writing some of John's biggest hits for him so it's it's amazing how amazing how it all worked out it's been a been a beautiful experience you know it really has yeah um so this is actually an interesting thing you got the gig from an unsolicited tape where I presume you would, you were quite young, so you were just kind of playing your flashiest licks and your most unique creative sounds, right? You weren't sending a tape of "Here I am trying to be mature in a pop setting." No, I was I was twenty one, twenty just about to turn twenty one, I think, and these were just instrumentals that, because I what I did before that was I sent a tape to Mike Varney to try and get in the spotlight column in Guitar Player magazine. Um, this all goes back into the dark ages. Any young people watching this would be like, oh my God, this is like archaeology here. It's, it's like, a magazine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, a magazine. And it had little floppy, <laughs> little floppy 45 discs in it. Like, incredible. Um, but uh, yeah, I noticed this Mike Varney guy was doing this spotlight column and I really enjoyed reading it about unknown players. And mm -hmm. I read it for a while and I thought, there's no Australians in here. And I thought, no, I should send him a tape, see what happens. And, and I couldn't believe it. I, I just forgot about it. Mm -hmm. and uh, and thought, oh, well, I suppose that's the end of that. Because back then, look, I mean, it took three months for the latest issue of Guitar Play to even get to Australia. It probably came on a boat. And um, and uh, <laughs> and I got I got this letter from a guy in Denmark or somewhere. Like, I remember sitting at my brother's kitchen reading it because they collected the mail that day. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Some guy from Denmark asking me all these weird questions about guitars. And then I spoke to a, a guy who I'd bought gear from in Melbourne at a shop and he used to go to America and buy gear all the time. And he came back and he rang me and he said, mate, he said, you're a guitar player. I said, what? And he said, yeah, I've got the latest issue here with Eric Clapton on the cover. He said, you're in it. You're in the spotlight thing. And I was like, wow, can you send it to me? And eventually it turned up in the mail and I couldn't believe it. I just, yeah. So, so yeah, my friend that went to America knew about it before I even did. So was that the thing where you would, you sent a recording, would they put that on the free 45? But that came with the magazine. They put your demo. No, they no, they didn't. What what Mike did was he would uh, put your contact information there, your mailing address, mm -hmm. and it was up to the readers to then respond to whoever they wanted to respond to, and and, it was, and then it was up to the person they wrote to to respond to them. So uh, just started getting these random letters from people all over the world asking if they could get my tapes. So I just start sending tapes to them, and yeah, it was just me. I I bought a drum kit off a mate of mine. My gag was I bought it for 150 bucks and, and instantly made it sound like it was worth 100 bucks. <laughs> and uh, me, you know, bashing away on this drum kit, borrowed a bass and had a little Fostex four track cassette recorder, and I just started making instrumentals and and just shredding like a nut job. But they were melodic. They were really melodic little songs. They weren't just it wasn't just me blowing an E minor or something. They were songs and and. Even though I, I used to play fast a lot, there was always there always was a sense of melody there. there. It wasn't just mindless. There was heart in it. I think that's what that's what Mike Va uh, Mike Varney mentioned. He said a lot of soul. Said I reminded him of uh, Michael Schenker, which I really loved. I thought that was a great what a great nod that was. I really enjoyed that. And he did he did mention that I something about me being highly original. Even back then, he said there was a high level of originality to it which really astonished me i wasn't ready for i wasn't even ready to get looked at but that once i had that that was the first um independent endorsement of my playing i ever had so i photocopied that page and that went out with all the letters so it was something for people to read like a review in a way because i had you know i didn't have any gig reviews or album reviews or practical professional experience zero mm -hmm. so i mean it was amazing that they even let me. Luckily, I wasn't the only guitar player in the band at that stage when I did that very first tour with John. Sam C., who's still a great friend of mine to this day and one of the most legendary Australian guitar players. Sam was in the band 
at the same time. And I remember thinking, oh, thank God for that. You know, so <laughs> I, 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 someone with experiences there, because I was so green, man. I mean, I just, I had no idea. And um, it was hysterical too, because I turned up, I had my four by 12 Marshall and this beautiful old Marshall plexi head that I had. And, um, and I had to buy another amplifier, like a Yamaha or something to use as a clean amp and I'd switch between them. And I remember we were doing this gig and it was in this place and it was like a cabaret sort of setting. <laughs> and the front of house guy, our front of house guy said, man, we've got to do something about your Marshall. And I said, why? And he said, it sounds like the ocean is coming in. He said, it's so, it was so quiet that all you could hear was the hiss from the gain coming out of my amp. And, and uh, oh, I was hysterical. Every time I put, tried putting a noise gate, I had this Dodd DOD preamp running into it that just cranked the gain. It was fantastic. It was the greatest sound but just hiss. And every time I tried putting a noise gate in front of it, it just screwed up the tone. So I, oh, well, it's going to hiss then, you know, <laughs> funny. So uh, we're talking 21 year old guys, just put out these shred tapes, gets a call from older guys to join a pop rock setting band. Yeah. And in my mind, you can see that going two ways. You could see them kind of throwing around their experience and suppressing you a bit and getting you to play ball, or you can see them kind of, nurturing you and allowing you to grow, which I think is given that you were given these guitar solos and you were hired off these kind of Mike Varney-esque recordings is the way it went, right? So how much- you know, it's a, that's, that's actually an interest. I, I love that you brought that up because I think this is the change of perception. It could be the change of perception of young people now as opposed to young people back then, because bearing in mind, yeah, I was a 20, 21 year old guy walking into a situation with musicians infinitely more experienced than me. And I walked in there as the martial artists say, the empty cup. I walked in there just going, teach me. I, I didn't look at, I, I looked at musicians that were 15, 20 years older than me and I didn't look at them and go, Ugh, old guys. I went, experience, knowledge, teach me. You know, I'm looking at the sensei and I'm just this green idiot walking in and that's exactly how it was. And man, I just, they accelerated my development tenfold because I just shut the hell up and listened. And that was so awesome. Like, I mean, that's why I was saying the experience has been so beautiful because I've heard nothing but horror stories from some of my friends about their first experiences venturing into the professional world of music. Just horrible experiences working for horrible people. And starting with Glenn Wheatley and John and uh, Ross Fraser and the Farnham Band as a total, every incarnation of it, just unbelievable, just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Like I couldn't have had a more dream run, but I swear to God, that was my, my thinking was you are here in a situation where if you just be quiet and observe and listen, and if someone gives you advice, you take it on board, then good things will happen and they did that's exactly how it was so and they were they were always just accepting of me and what i did because it was the time let's face it back then it was the time of the face melding guitar solo and if a face melder was what you wanted that's what you got i was more than capable of delivering it it just that's what i'd trained myself to do and luckily that was that was the order of the day like quickly that changed but luckily i evolved with that too so so, and that's turned me into the player I am now, which is, which is very different to that. I couldn't, I couldn't play like that way. I couldn't play that way now. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I've seen some of your videos. I saw that, that lick you showed on your Patreon last week. I saw it and was like, yeah, okay, cool. Picked up my guitar a couple of days later and tried the stretch. I was like, you gotta be kidding. What is that? Yeah, it <laughs> almost killed me. <laughs> it almost killed me. I, I thought, oh man, I'm too old for this. It's like, it's like I, those days. I remember the, that was that the subway lick? The, yeah, 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 the subway lick. I remember doing that. I remember sitting there vividly, sitting in TJ's apartment, beautiful sunny day, LA sun streaming in. And we were just doing those trade-offs. And I sat there and I thought, I should put a lick here, shouldn't I? And I just had <laughs> Sean Lane echoing in my mind from doing some trivial funk. and. I said, what would Sean do? I go, well, I'll pretend I'm Sean for a minute. And I just threw that down like it was nothing. I went, yeah, that's great. That'll do. And we just probably went to Subway and got a sandwich. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> and just to get it recorded for this almost, literally almost took my hands out. Like, uh, yeah, time has not been kind. I, think, I remember when I was trying to play it, the, the only thing going through my head was, 
Calm down, Brett. Like, why this, <laughs> why, calm it down. Why, why are we doing this? Um, but yeah, that's a great lick. Um, so wow. that's that's cool. So we're, we're with Farnham, right? We're talking early 80s, 81, 80, 82, or a little bit later? No, 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 uh, 85 onwards. 85. The, um, the big album hit in 86. So that's, so that's the thing. We hit this big album. Instantly, you're in the biggest band. You're the guitarist in the biggest band in Australia but while supporting the biggest artist. Which, which that curve is amazing because when I first did the tour with him, the very first gig I did with him was at a, was at a pub not far from where I live. And, my, and I played there with our cover band. We would played there a few years earlier. And I remember the lady that owned the pub did nothing but complain about us because we were too loud. And we had the, this tiny little PA system. Nothing was mic'd up. It was just the most bare bones, shove a band in a corner of a pub and there you go. And she just absolutely gave us nothing but hell all night because we were too loud. And there's the first gig with Farm. And I, I, I remember walking in there, looking at the sound check, looking at the PA going, eh, it's a lot bigger than the one we had. And, and she was there, she still owned the pub, and she sat down the front like this, looking at John the whole night, just thinking that all her dreams had come true. <laughs> and I'm standing there, we were playing some great stuff too. We were playing Legs by ZZ Top and Black Knight. We played great that, tune. we played a whole lot of love. I mean, it was nuts. We were doing all this really hard rock stuff and John's screaming his lungs out singing. It's just fantastic. And, and she's just loving it and it's, 20 times louder than our poor old pub band ever was. And I thought, yeah, I think I've just learned something valuable about show business right here. So, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so we're now we're here in John Farnham's band. And this is what I said at the start. There's still a huge evolution yet to come in your playing, right? You, you're in the, this chart topping band and you're still driving and developing yourself and pushing harder and leaning in more to that original sound when Maybe some people under that workload and under that stress would just kind of chill, take it easy. You, you're kind of somewhere you've arrived. How did you find that work ethic? Was that just natural? Were you gigging and then still trying to practice I, every other hour? I think it came from, I mean, I don't know if it's the same for everybody all over the world, but for someone who grew up in rural Australia, um, we, you know, we, we have a certain kind of, uh, mentality here which is which is incredibly self self disparaging and we never really think much of ourselves around here or it's a, maybe it's a unique australian trait where they <laughs> they call it the tall poppy syndrome where the minute the, the poppy rises too high they try to cut it down and uh that's the 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 uh metaphor they use for that but it's it's yeah i i i i never i never thought i was good enough to be in that band i mean I never thought I ever deserved that shot. And I just thought, I've got to try harder. I've got to live up to this. John was never anything but absolutely supportive of me. He's been one of my biggest champions my entire life. And, and I just couldn't even thank him enough for that. And the rest of the band were too. They did nothing but try and lift me up and pump me up. And, but I just had this feeling that you, you don't deserve to be here, man. You've got to, you've got to get better. But the trouble was, I, I didn't really have anyone around to ask, like as far as a guitar player went. They were, I was surrounded by great musicians. David Hirschfelder was the keyboard player in the band for the longest time I was in it, and David's an Oscar-nominated film composer. He's one of the great geniuses of our time. And, and I, I should have been sitting in David's room grilling him about harmony, but I didn't know where to start. I, this, is a guy that, this is a guy that didn't know how to didn't know what a Mixolydian scale was back then. I knew how to play it, but I didn't know what it was called. And I didn't know where it came from or why it was the way it was. I knew nothing about any kind of, any kind of harmony or theory at all. Completely flying by. But the, the one, there was all these pivotal turning points and one of them was a lot of times on these tours, I just make friends with other guitar players and they'd come by the hotel and we just sit in the room jamming all day. And, this one guy, I wish I could remember what the bloke's name was because I'd like to thank him. And um, we were obviously talking about Holdsworth and we were talking about uh, the Bruford albums. And I was saying how much I love Jeff Berlin's bass playing on, on the One of a Kind album. And I remember the next day we were going to catch a plane and he comes bolting up to me at the gate. I don't know how he even knew I was there, but he's got this cassette in his hand. He said, man, I'm going to give you this before you go. Hey, have a listen to it on the plane. See you later. And that was the last I ever saw of him. And he just gives me this cassette with Jeff Berlin written on it in, in pencil. 
And so I've got my little Walkman, we get on the plane, plane starts taking off, and I go, well, I'll chuck it in. And the very first, the very first song is Mother Load from the uh, Champion album. And the first thing I hear is Scott Henderson. And I hear that melody, and I'm like, oh, who the hell's this guitar player? I love that, that sound. Like, it's, it's sort of Alan, but not Alan. Like, what is this? Who is this? And then, of course, the solo hits me, and I'm like, oh, my God, who is this guy? And then it, this little cassette just ends up influencing me for the next two years of my life. I'm just listening to this unknown guitar player, no internet, no way of researching who it is, no way to find the album. I think the album's already out of print by this stage. And uh, so anyway, two, three years go by and I end up in Los Angeles. It's 1990 and we're doing the Nelson record at Cherokee Studios and TJ uh, Helmrich introduces himself to me and we just become friends. And he said, hey, uh, you want to go up and see MI? I teach up there, Musician, Musicians Institute. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. He said, we'll go up Tuesday. Henderson's teaching there. And I said, who's Henderson? He said, Scott Henderson. He said, you'll like him. And so we go up there and we walk into the room and there's Scott and surrounded by students and he sort of looks up and shoots this look like, oh, great, two more long-haired bloody metal guys. And, and so we sit down and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, well, this would be interesting. I wonder who this bloke is. And they start playing a jazz standard and I don't think he even had a distortion sound. I think it was a clean tone. And that, I, I give him three notes and I've gone, oh, my God, it's the guy on the cassette. I just picked it straight away and I've, I'm sitting there going, Jesus, I'm in the room with the guy on the cassette, the Jeff Berlin guy. And I, there you go. If I ever needed proof of having an identity, that's it. But, but that hearing Scott on, look, Larry Carlton really had an effect on me too, but that was earlier. He was like the, the precursor to all this and Scott was the, just the final nail in the coffin. It was just like, get to know your stuff, you know, because as soon as I heard him, I went, this is a guy who knows what he's doing and is a supreme musician, a musical player. Like it just, it just absolutely flattened me. And it still does. I mean, I'm still Scott's biggest fan to this day. So he's the one guy I'd get on the plane and fly overseas to see if I could. So <laughs> there you go. Awesome. So actually, that's great. We've fast forwarded a bit to MI, TJ, and the stuff that's going on there. The first thing is, um, I just want to get a, an idea of what what your relationship with MI was. Did you do open counselling there or did you ever, were you ever on staff there? Uh, I sort of ended up as a, I think I was sort of on staff, but it started off with just uh, Keith Wyatt, who was, uh, I think, head of, head of the guitar department at this stage, um, asked me to come up and do like a show in the, the big room, in the, the 101, I think they called it, the big main concert room. And um, it, was, it was fantastic. I think it, I definitely remember Tim Bogart was playing bass for me. And uh, Tim, uh, oh, God, fantastic drummer. I can't remember his name. I'm having, having a blank on it. But, um, you know, I had these, and, and Keith was playing guitar as well. And it was just awesome. Like, because they, they invited me up there, probably probably on TJ's behest, I'd say. But, but I think Keith sort of had an idea of who I was. And they invited me up there as the guitar player from Nelson. And... Um, I remember when he introduced me and, and a large portion of the room just laughed and just said, because Nelson were kind of considered a joke at that stage, like, uh, which was a shame because it was a great, a killer band. I mean, and, and a great album, like really great melodic music. I love those songs. They, they had hit written all over them and they were hits. They were great hits and the band was amazing. The, but anyway, I just, yeah, I heard the laughs and I went, yeah, it should be right. <laughs> so we just started playing and they didn't laugh anymore after that because because they they hadn't heard anything like that like everybody I met this is not me bragging I'm just stating a fact like everybody I met was were great players but they were all cut from the same cloth like speed picking three note per strings shapes patterns no one had ever met a guy like me that that had the influences that I'd had yet still had a rock attitude they just and can improvise. I mean, mm -hmm. they they'd never come across that before, and it was a different sound for them. And it was, it was great. It was really great to show up places and just have people go, "What the hell are you doing?" How difficult was it to maintain your trajectory whilst everyone else around you is, you know, this speed picker kind of like when the heroes of the day, or you know, like we had Paul Gilbert coming out and all those guys. Was that something that you, you found it easy to stay true to or were you feeling constantly pulled in different directions? 
No, it was it was easy to stay true to it because I had no choice. I couldn't. I can't. I still can't speed pick. I I just and my mentality was it just wasn't natural for me to think that way, where it was totally natural for me to just do what I do, which is a completely alien concept to a lot of the other people. Not so much now, but uh, but back then, like especially the finger picking stuff. I mean, I remember going when I, just before I started touring with Farnham. I remember me and my girlfriend and my friend went down to Melbourne to because I was looking for guitar amps to get another amp to have a, as a clean amp. And so we walk into this shop. Everyone's in there with their flock of seagulls hairstyles, you know, and fancy clothes with buttons all over. It was the 80s after all, right? <laughs> and um, and we walk in looking like, you know, ACDC's road crew. I mean, we're all wearing like stretch jeans, black T-shirts and Adidas sneakers and and. We were dressed the same. We never even realised it. The three of us, I remember we walked in and the guys just looked at us and all laughed and said, Jesus, regulation footwear. And uh, <laughs> and um, and so I walked in and I had the had my Strat and that Strat and its uh, case. And I said, I want to try out some amps. Can you, you know, help me out? And the guy said, yeah, fair enough. Like a Seagulls guy helps me out. And and um, I typical me, I'd gone all the way there without a guitar pick. I said, have you got a pick by any chance? And he said, do you want me to play it for you, mate? <laughs> and I said, no, nah, no, I'm okay. So I just, I didn't worry about it. I just, oh, I just want to try the amp and get out of here. So I just started doing my thing. And he just stopped and said, what are you doing? And I said, what, what do you mean? Am I doing something wrong? And he said, no, your right hand. What the bloody hell's going on there? And I'm, I'm doing the hybrid thing. And, and he said, hey, fellas, come and have a look at this. And I'm like, I, it was very disconcerting, but I, you know, it was, it was unusual for me to, to experience that. But it seemed to follow me everywhere I went because... I had no idea that, that I was doing anything out of the ordinary. Not to say I was the only person doing this, obviously, but it just wasn't as prevalent as someone with amazing picking chops and all that. And would you say that's almost down to the fact that you grew up in this guitar seclusion, like you didn't have all these guys around you to, to get the mainstream education from, and you were Absolutely. figuring things out for yourself? Absolutely. My, my good friend, Glenn Quill, here in town, I remember I was about 13 and him and I used to jam together and he showed me a, a nine chord and, and showed me how you could, you know, shove your little finger down and do a vamp and all that sort of stuff, which was, that was, that was new. That was something very new to me. And after that, he was like, that's all I got, kid. You're on your own from here on out, you know, and, and we were all in the same boat. It wasn't like someone up the road knew the secret scale or that guy over there is a great jazz musician or this person plays classical or country or we're all just self-taught rock guys and we were all on our own. And, and uh, the only thing I had was my record collection and the desire to try and just figure this stuff out. And, and if things happen naturally, they just happened. Like I, like I said, the, the hybrid picking just started naturally. It just happened one day, and it was mainly from trying to play acoustic tunes, not knowing people use their thumbs or a thumb pick. I just assumed they used their pick and the other three fingers because that's I'd, I'd been taught with a pick. I took three three or four lessons off a guy here in town, and he taught me to use a pick, and that was it. And the same with the slide playing, the angling of the slide, like all just. I wonder if this would work, and it actually worked. You know, I didn't. I found out year, decades later that Jeff Beck was already doing it, but I never knew. I was just already doing. I was doing that, and people used to bring that up all the time too. Like, what the hell are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm just playing slide. What are you doing? And, <laughs> and you know, I I didn't know. I just I was just astonished that people thought it was interesting. Yeah, I think that's something that's uh, we're losing. We're losing access to that <clears throat> exploration um, that I think people in earlier generations were forced to do like we don't need to sit down for hours with a recording to try and work something out because we can just go and google it and find the tabs and i think that we we lose a, a huge part of of our possibilities as players i i did notice when when eddie van halen became such a huge thing and i i just loved eddie i mean i was i remember there was a tv show here called countdown in australia and that was the rock show and uh and I remember sitting there and it was like, this is, you know, late seventies and just you know, disco, 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 all of a sudden, and I'm like, what's this? And I sit there and I watch it and it's, they show it on a Sunday night and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what's this, what's this, what's this name of the band? What's the name of the band? Didn't even find out what the name of the band was. They, if they mentioned it, I didn't hear it. 
and all I just a vague glimpse of something happening like this. Luckily, they repeated the show the following Saturday, so I had to wait a whole week. I was ready, man. I was there with my cassette player. I was, I'm going to get it. I got it on. Van Halen. Okay, what's he doing? Some something with this something. Go into my record shop on the Monday, buy the album. I was one of two people in this town that bought that album, and the other guy gave his back apparently. So, and so I I bring it home, and I'm like, well, I've just found my new Bible. This is it. And uh, and eventually. I just remembered seeing that thing and listening to Eruption and going, what is he doing? And eventually figured it out and was like, oh my God, the whole, the universe exploded. And, and that album just became everything to me. I mean, it just, it just engulfed me. And, but what I found was over the course of trying to figure out a lot of Eddie's stuff, I couldn't get it right something else would emerge from failing to get it right. Like I'd think, well, I'm not doing what Eddie's doing, but this is a pretty cool lick. Like things would happen that weren't what Eddie was doing, which was a disappointment. But at the same time, I thought, you know, I could still use this though. And I think that a lot of time, that's what we do miss is, is in the quest to figure things out and not being able to see it and not being able to have it in glorious HD or tab written out or whatever. The years, there's a multitude of ways to play something you can hear. And, and sometimes doing it the wrong way leads you up a different path and who knows where you can end up from that. It's, it can be a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, so we've got Van Halen, we've got tapping. You've got, we've spoken about your hybrid picking, but your approach to legato is also fairly unique in that you're kind of all hammers or you do a lot of, um, you, do you do, you do hammers when you pull off, you, you pull off to oh, it's, it's, look at, some, I mean, sometimes I'll do pull-offs if the lick sort of, if the lick, lick warrants it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Alan, the reason I do all hammers is not for the same reason Alan did it. Alan did it because he didn't like the sound of pull-offs. I read that in interviews. But, see, his hands were so massive that he could, you know, he could span like seven frets or something and, and each finger would legitimately come down on the strings like a hammer, like a, like a tap note. Whereas for me, I need to do all hammers because I got to move, man. I can't stretch for anything. I remember our famous, uh, our famous picture of, of when all of us were sitting on the live stream chat. You know, my, my fingers are bent so poorly and my stretch is so bad that, oh, sorry, sorry, microphone. Um, I, I, I need to move. Otherwise, I won't be able to access the notes I want to access. So it, they just have to become hammers. So for me, it's a case of have to. And... In regards to legato, I was always a legato player. No one ever, no one ever even mentioned to me you should pick every note or you even could. I just, like I said, I took four lessons. The guy taught me four songs. But the, the, the one thing he said, which is the pivotal thing, he said, what do you want to learn? And I said, I want to be a lead guitar player. I like Richie Blackmore. And he said, okay, fair enough. And he drew a picture of a left hand and he wrote one, two, three, four. And he went four fingers, four frets. And right from day one, I just went, okay, Use all your fingers. So it wasn't it wasn't a case of me having these guys be strong and this one hanging off to the side and eventually being frustrated by it. They all they all developed pretty pretty uniformly. So just one of those lucky accidents where he gave me some beautiful information right off the bat. But I was always a legato guy, and like I said, I I uh, I don't know if we've talked about this, but I I was getting attention around town. This this kid's a really good guitar player, and nothing it didn't go to my head because I was like, look man, I can go home and pick out an album at random and they're all better than me, trust me. I wasn't stupid. And, um, but I thought, well, I'm doing the right thing. I'm on the right course because I was always worried that I was doing the, the wrong thing because I had no guidance. And I thought, geez, I'm doing this right. I hope I don't find out years from now I've mucked it all up. And then I read this Frank uh, Zappa interview where someone said, you're a pretty fast guitar player, Frank. And he said, well, I'm not really because I don't pick every note. I play one note and then my left hand does a whole bunch of stuff. And and I went, oh my God, that's what I do. That's what I do. I've got it wrong. I, bloody, I knew it. I'd bloody get it wrong. And, um, and I, I, was, I was this this close to just quitting. I thought, I can't show my face in public anymore. I've, I've got to quit. I'm a charlatan. I've buggered this up. It's got to stop. And then I, Eddie Van Halen does his first guitar player cover and I read about, Frank Zapp, uh, read about Alan Holdsworth. He said, you've got to hear Alan. You've got to hear him on the, In the Dead of Night from the first UK album. And uh, 
think it was Hell's Bells from uh, One of a Kind. And luckily my cohort at the local music shop who'd find all the hard to find albums for me got the UK album, took it home, In the Dead of Night comes on and the minute that solo hits I go, legato. And I went, you just got to do what you, you got to do your thing, you know. Because I, look, I, I was listening to Alan through the whole album just going, this guy's just a monster. I mean, this is some of the most unbelievable stuff I've ever heard in my life. This guy obviously could play the guitar any way he wants to. He is choosing to play this way. I just knew that he'd, he'd done this by design. It wasn't like, oh, this is all I know how to do. And, and I was right. I mean, over years, we found out Alan could pick. He could do all that stuff. Everything he did was by design. and It was guided by the sound he was after. But the main thing I took from that was just follow your heart and do what, do what you should do and don't worry about rules or anything like that just I was lucky that I'd get this information and interpret it in a way that was incredibly positive and constructive and helpful rather than rather than negative so I was lucky that way yeah I'd say very lucky because that's a huge problem lots of players have yeah um, today so I want to continue on a little timeline because there's a couple of big things that I want to talk about which is your stuff with TJ and then maybe get into a little bit if we've got time about the conception and the execution of centrifugal funk and how that all came about. Okay. So, um, I just want to talk about we the should, stuff. We should, we should probably put centrifugal funk first cause that okay. came first. So. Oh, did it? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. You see what happened was, what happened was there was a friend of mine in England, Maurizio Mielli, and, uh, he, um, he sent my cassette to, to Mark Varney, Mike Varney's brother. And Mark was starting the Legato Records label, and he already had Frank Ambali on the label and had done some releases with Frank. And he was looking for artists, and uh, Maurizio sent him my cassette, and he really liked what he heard, just those melodic instrumentals. And Mark had contacted me long before I ever went to America, and we were already talking about trying to do an album. And I just didn't know how I was going to do it because the budgets he was talking about were so small, and in Australia it was a different ball game here. There were no independent studios. You were... You're either in a big studio or you weren't. So anyway, by the time I eventually end up in America in 1989, Mark and I make contact. And Mark starts telling me, like, he said, I want to do something with you. He said, I want to, there's this project I'm putting together next year and I want to, I want to get you on it. And that was kind of where we left it. And I just went back to doing the Nelson record and stuff like that. And then the following year in 1990, he said, well, I'm doing this thing. He said, I want you, Frank Ambali and Sean Lane. And I was like, Okay, cool. Well, I, I knew who Frank was because Frank had already had a major impact on me. And I didn't know who Sean was. And then as, t as luck would have it, I uh, went back to Australia and came back in early 1990. And Bobby Rock, who was the drummer for Nelson, I was living with him and his mate Tim in Van Nuys. Bobby was old friends with Sean. And he goes, hey, man, you got to check this out. And Sean had sent him this video of him and this drummer playing at the Bombay Bicycle Club somewhere in... I guess somewhere in Memphis where Sean lived. They're doing all these Mike Stern tunes and Brecker Brothers stuff and, and some of his originals. And I'm sitting there looking at it going, who the hell is this guy? Like, you know, just where did this space alien come from? And, and then Mike, uh, Mark tells me he wants to do this album and Sean's on it. And I was like, oh, geez, I'm going to get killed. <laughs> I'm just going to get obliterated here. But I thought, I've got to do it. I mean, how can I turn this down? So he went, he actually took me to see the band that did that that did all the tracks rehearsing and it was uh jimmy uh uh jimmy earl playing bass uh, uh uh joey heredia on drums um i think steve faglioni was there playing sax and iwi and uh mike o'neill who played rhythm guitar for george benson for years was playing guitar and i can't remember who was playing keyboards unfortunately but they were just smoking and mike in particular I was, mike was taking solos while they were rehearsing just to fill out the space of where the solos were going to go. And I, was, I said to Mark, he is playing on the album, right? He's going to take some solos. And Mark said, no, no, Mark's just doing rhythms. And I was like, Jesus, he's the rhythm guitar player is going to kill me. And, oh, man, he was so good. And then in the middle of all that, Mark says, hey, come out the car. I want to play you something. So he takes me out to his car and plays me the advanced mixes of Truth in Shredding with Alan and Frank on this album. And I'm sitting there listening to it going, what have you done? I said, you've, you've just, you've got the two most revolutionary guitar players to ever walk the earth on the same album together playing like this. It's unbelievable. And so I was privy to so much fantastic stuff over there at that time. And, and so we ended up, you know, Mike, uh, Mark called me up and he said, well, it's 
time to do your tracks. So, you know, come to Costa Mesa. And I think the, what the hell was the studio called? It was where Alan Holdsworth did um, uh, Metal Fatigue and all that, like Music Grinder, I think it was called, in Costa Mesa. Because I remember I walked in and the first thing I saw was the Metal Fatigue cover on the wall. And I was like, oh my God, Alan worked here. And, and um, the first track I did was, uh, was uh, So What? And I had, this, I had this strat that my friends here in Melbourne had made for me with EMGs in it. And, um, but I didn't take an amp. And they said, yeah, we've got an amp. And they just drag out this little 50-watt Marshall. If you tried to buy it now, you'd have to pay 20 grand for it. It was one of the greatest Marshalls I've ever heard. And just the 412 cab, matching 412 cab. And I just plugged into it and turned everything on 10. And that sound is what's on the So What solo. And uh, I, I went back later and did uh, the other solos for Hey T-Bone and uh, Lovestruck. And I took my Hughes and Kettner amp with me. I remember TJ listening to the final mixes and said, why didn't you keep using the Marshall? Oh, man. He said, he said you blew it there. And uh, he was right. That, that Marshall was a killer. But, uh, but luckily, I was the first guy to play on it. I mean, I hadn't heard Frank. I hadn't heard Sean. If I'd heard those guys solo on that stuff, I probably would have just run away screaming. But luckily, I just got to play and do my thing and the funny thing was the funny thing was the first solo I did on I remember on so what the first solo I did was it was a good solo it was really really sort of tasteful and pop rock you know a bit a few chops you know things like that and I remember listening to it going yeah it's a good solo that and Mark just said no 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 more and I said what he said way more he said you're going to need to go way further than that and he said, I want this way more intense than that, more. And I remember sitting there going, this has never happened to me on a session before. Most of the time I'd be on a pop rock session and they'd say, yeah, maybe halve it and then halve it again and we might be getting as close to something that belongs on this song. And, and so they were com comparatively easy to do, but uh, it was actually quite, quite scary to have someone say, no, nah, you've got to go way further than that, more. So that's, that's, why, that's why there's so much just... Eight billion notes a minute on that thing is because that's what Mark wanted. It was the producer's call. He said, "I want all you got. Give it to me." So that's what he got. <laughs> and were you just doing take after take, like improvising, or were you writing, taking breaks, writing licks, like with Subway? Or I wrote no licks. No, it was all improvised, just off the cuff. Because I know that's how Frank and Sean were going to roll. They weren't going to, they weren't going to do anything. The the interesting thing about so what there is a punch in it, but it's not a punch because I made a mistake. It's it's a punch because I thought the song had ended. And I remember I stopped and I went, oh, it's still going. And they said, that's ah, all right, we'll just drop in. So I can I could show you the exact spot, but um, it's quite seamless. But uh, we just did it in two halves like that. The other solos were just roll tape and you get what you get. So um, I remember I did try to play on a song called Splatch, the Miles Davis tune, and it was a sort of a melodic minor thing. And I, I didn't know the melodic minor scale back then. I'd never heard it before. And I remember listening to it going, Mark said, could you play on this? And I was going, what's it's weird it's like sort of major and minor at the same time I could hear it like I was going why can't I figure this out like it's it's like two tonalities sort of fighting each other but it sounds great but I don't know what to do with it and um, of course you know Frank and Sean had no problem with it at all they just played beautifully on it so I said oh, I'll have to sit this one out man it's it's not my bag I'm afraid but uh, but um, yeah like a year later after we after TJ and I'd worked together and he, he showed me the scale <laughs> like uh, I probably would have played a lot of stuff on it, but um, at that time, no, I didn't know that scale. That's amazing. So, um, is that the only track on the album you're not on, or are you are you on selected tracks? No, there's there's a few I'm not on, like actual proof. No way, no way. I'd be able to would have been able to navigate a song like that back then. I mean, there's there's quite a few of the tracks. I think it's just Frank, because because mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, you know, Frank Supreme Fusion guitarist i mean my god you know that's like the he just you know i was in so in awe it was so wonderful like as i just finished up and i was about to walk out the door frank walked in and i got to have the most wonderful chat with him we've, we've really become good friends over the years we keep running into each other at various things and he's just awesome and and um that's why i wanted to do a video that i put on youtube and talk about his influence because i mentioned it to him on a recent uh, lesson he did with my friend chris johnson and and he was quite surprised when I said, you had a massive impact on me. Because I don't think he put the, he didn't connect it because I don't sweep pick. And I said, no, it's, the, it's your left hand, you know, your left hand, man. The way you arrange the notes, it was, it just changed everything for me. It's, uh, it's what 
sort of made the, the hybrid picking thing work for me as an improvisational tool rather than here's some tricks, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. You can see that that's one of the things that sets you apart um, from a lot of other players, how you lay things out with the left hand, how, you know, your, your barring and how you aren't necessarily dependent on big string skips to get some lines that um, are really quite obscure and intervallic. All from um, Frank. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's Frank. Yeah. Well, just, if we're on influences and stuff like that, what about your, your time with TJ? How did that, he was teaching you, well, he was putting you in situations that you maybe hadn't played in before. Was that kind of, were you making the music to push yourselves? What was the, what was the impetus there? What was the, the reason behind those records? TJ and I, we met, uh, I think it was 1990, very early 1990. We met uh, because he was working at Cherokee Studios down in uh, LA and that's where we did the Nelson record. And the funny thing is that um, I was I did an outro solo for the for a song on the album called Everywhere I Go, and uh, it was a, I really loved the solo. It was a long solo, like thirty six bars, just a blow over the till it faded out. And um, the first half of it was really good. I really loved the first half. Some really, I thought I've really got a big chunk of my personality on this album. You know. I mean, there were other chunks too, but this was definitive. I thought, this is really important to me. And the last half was good, but I thought, ah, yeah, I'm starting to sort of run out of ideas here. You know, they'll be faded out by then, doesn't matter. And I remember I came in the next day and Mark Tanner, the producer, Mark was a lovely guy, but I think he had a bit of a bug up his butt about me because I kept going back to Australia to work with Farnham. And he, he said, have a listen to this. And he put on the solo. First 18 bars, and I'm going, yeah, good yeah, good stuff. Then the last 18 bars, and I thought, yeah, it's starting to get a bit lame here. And he stopped and went, everything you heard up to this point is going on the cutting room floor. How do you like them apples? And I just sort of looked at him and went, okay. You know, it's like, I mean, me now would have said, you put that on the tape or I'm grabbing this return ticket and I'm smashing everything in this room before I go. There'd be a very different scenario <laughs> if, I, if it happened now. I'm not the same meek little guy I was back then. But, but I went, okay, you know, the producer, whatever you want to do. But the funniest thing is TJ had, he was in there cleaning ashtrays and things, and they're doing rough mixes. And he's heard this solo come on, and he's gone, this guitar player's doing two-hand tapping. He's doing my thing. Bloody hell. And uh, so unbeknownst to them, they've gone home, packed everything up. He's dug the tapes out, thrown, thrown them back up on the 24 track and done his own mix of it and done a cassette. <laughs> Naughty boy, man, he could get into big trouble for this. But he's done his own mix and took it home and had to listen to it. And he thought, I've got to meet this guy, figure out what he's doing. And so he introduces himself one day and says, oh, you know, I really love your playing. I've been hearing it on the tracks in there and you want to hang out. And there was just something about him. I just went. This guy's good. I just know he's not a he's not a, a wanker. He's not an idiot. I just I don't know. He just sort of I just had an intuition that this guy knows what he's doing. And sure enough, we sat down and within about two seconds he started doing this, and I went, "Yeah, I was right." And I went, "Damn, someone actually figured it out. Someone actually did it." And TJ did it. And so we look. We'd been hanging for a long time before we started working, writing songs and things. So yeah, we'd sit together all day, and and you know he'd teach me scales and things. He we were, we were jamming and, and uh, you know, I'd start jamming over something. He put on an E bass line and I'd just start playing Mixolydian licks to it because of a Larry Carlton and the Norman Brothers and all the rest of it. And, and he said one day, he said, man, he said, you really like playing Mixolydian, don't you? And I said, I do. What's that? And he said, you don't know what that is? And I said, no, what the hell is it? Sounds like a disease or something. And, uh, <laughs> and um, it's serious. You've got Mixolydian. And, um he said, it's this. And, of course, he played me the scale. And I went, oh, that, yeah, major scale with a flat seven. Yeah, I love that sound. And he said, what other things do you know? And I said, oh, I don't know. I said, I like playing a minor scale, but having a flat seven in that, that's nice. And so I'll play a major seven and I'll, uh, a major scale and I'll raise the fourth. That's a nice sound. And he said, you don't know what any of these things are called? And I said, nah. And he, he told me all the modes. And I was like, wow, they've got names. This is awesome. And uh I said, what other ones are there? And he said, have you ever heard of melodic minor? And I said, no, what's that? And he said, it's like a major scale with a minor third. And I sat there and played it and I went, oh my God, splatch. <laughs> Straight away, <laughs> I thought, oh, curses. Where um, were you last year? <laughs> I know, you know. And, uh, but um, yeah, so he would, he would just show me stuff and we would work on it. We'd come up with chord progressions and jam over it all day. And we just had a whale of a time. It was the greatest hang. 
and that's how we ended up working together on an album because we we just go sit up on the Hollywood Hills looking out over the smog and and because I I told Mark about TJ as well and TJ sent him a tape and probably had Horizon Dream on it and songs like that and Mark's like well I want you to do an album for me too and we're sitting there on the Hollywood Hills I remember it quite vividly we're sitting there got a couple of beers you know and we said how are we going to make albums for five grand man that we you know five grand couldn't even get the drum tracks done for that and uh and I don't know whether TJ thought of it or I thought of it, but we just decided, why don't we say to Mark, we're going to pull the budget, but for the, pu the budget, you get two guitar players. So, you know, we'll get 10 grand and we'll make an album for you, but we'll both be on it. And he, he thought that was a great idea. So that's how quid pro quo happened. We just pulled the budget and started writing songs. And, and we, just, we just had this direction for it where we said, well, we'd like to have some changes in there, like, to improvise over and they, they, we want to we really love tribal tech obviously because of scott's influence and we thought we'd love to have some sort of tribal techie sounding stuff and and as it turned out we managed to get willis to play on it because he did it as a favor to tj i think and uh and um and uh that was how it all came together and we, we were very specific like no boogies because everyone had ever since satch had had the big hit with satch boogie which i sort of took as a carry on from the dregs, you know, from the Dixie dregs. Like Steve Morse to me exemplified that whole rumpa dumpa 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 thing. And and Satch blew it out of the water with uh, Satch Boogie and every shrapnel release had bloody boogies on it everywhere. You know, everyone's doing a ran 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 boogie thing, you know. And, and uh, you know, they all played the same way and and um, we said none of that, we're not doing any of that. And uh, and so the album just had a different trajectory to it. The only album out there that was that was similar in the sort of way it didn't follow any other path like that was was probably Powers of Ten, but even that had a boogie on it. You know, it had uh, that uh, that Sean did a boogie on there. I can't remember what it was, but uh, but uh, yeah, no boogies. So. <laughs> awesome. So there's actually two key things I just want to ask about. The first is, what, did you know TJ was this tapper before the first time you you saw him play, or did he just like? play for you and you're like what the hell is this he did mention to me like upon our meeting he just said yeah we should come up to my house we'll have a have my apartment we'll have a jam and he said i do um eight finger style playing and i was like okay i have no idea what that is i, I didn't know i thought maybe he's like a stanley jordan kind of guy i don't know but uh i don't know like i said my just my intuition was this guy's on the level i i'm going to go to a strange person's apartment in hollywood and i have no <laughs> idea what he does he could have been the biggest tosser i'd ever met in my life and the minute he played i just went oh my god someone did it someone actually did it and this guy did it oh, this is brilliant so yeah it was just great and we just we just hit it off as people same stupid sense of humor and and yeah we just we just you know we're still old mate. we're like family so yeah and then what doors did his impact with with theory open for you because now all of a sudden you're you're comfortable playing in all these new settings which you might not have, like Splatch, for example, was that a, a huge breakthrough for how your actual musical taste went after that? Did you feel freer to do different things? Well, yeah, big time, because he would, you know, he would help us arrange chord progressions and things that would move us through all these different tonalities. And then the, the, the goal was to try and figure them out, like how are we going to do it? And... Um, and yeah, it just opened all sorts of doors to me. I, I, he was the first guitar player I'd ever hung out with that knew more about harmony and theory than I did. And you, you didn't need to know a lot to know that, but, uh, but TJ knew a lot because he'd studied a lot before he even got to MI. And um, yeah, he was just a wealth of information. It was great. And then the, the work we do over that um, was great for him too because he was applying it to his two-hand style and just becoming a ferocious improviser like it was just it was really exciting we man we would just jam for hours like just hours it was incredible fun and writing at the same time and yeah it was it, we're having a ball it's just brilliant it's it's super inspiring to see you from the start of your time with john to after quid pro quo that development that's happened in was six years maybe is yeah it was kind of compressed ridiculous. and it was it was almost like it's almost like the, the hybrid picking thing because uh, that was always there the technique was always there and there's evidence of it from way way back like i've i there's no video of me around before 
really before I joined John's band, um, video cameras weren't prevalent back then, but, uh, but there's plenty of audio where you can hear it happening. But just like I said, when I, when I looked at the way Frank arranged notes on the fretboard and used them in an improvisational capacity where it wasn't just a lick, like Frank was demonstrating lots of licks, but he was just improvising. And that's what really caught me. I looked at it and went, I could use this. You know, you look at the macro, but then you look at the micro of it and go, well, is it just a lick or is there something contained in there that can become part of the very way I approach this instrument? And once I started to tear it apart like that and look at it that way, and I realized all the facility was here in this right hand, it really was just like someone tapped me on the head with a magic wand and said, you can now do this, go ahead. And it was amazing. It was just such an amazing moment. And then 90% of that stuff happened within about a three month period and all ended up on Seafunk. All those, a lot of the licks you hear on there that, that, uh, that were on those songs, that they were all born out of just hours of time spent in a lonely little apartment in, in uh, Van Nuys working them out and doing it and then the same thing was when I finally met TJ and we started to work on this harmony stuff I was just so ready for it I was dying for it I've been starved of this my whole life and mm -hmm. it wasn't even necessarily be that, that I'd learned a new scale I'd I'd found a key to unlock a sound I'd heard by listening to all the stuff I'd listened to but didn't know how to do so it was it was amazing awesome I've just got two very short questions to finish on if someone hasn't heard of you where would you put someone's ear first where would you say listen to this or is there a track or a solo that you're most proud of or that you think sums is the complete amalgamation of all all the different facets of your playing um man it's a tough one in terms of songwriting one of the songs i love the most is a, a song called brothers from big sky because mm -hmm. i do i do remember writing it i wrote it it was just after my brother had passed away and it was back in 2002 and I'd come back to uh, back to Los Angeles, and I was uh, living with Rick Fiorabracci at the time. I think he was out late at night, sitting on his couch. Massive thunderstorm happening. I remember that, and I sat there, and and um, and it just fell out of the guitar. It was one of those ones where I just sat there, and it just the, the song just fell out of the guitar. And uh, and I, I also I just loved the song. I thought, what a beautiful thing this is. And I just played it for ages to try and remember it. And it was one of the first tunes, the only tune I've ever written where I thought this would work great with a trio because I was doing a lot of trio gigs with him and Tos Panos at the time. And I always struggled because none of my songs were really built for trios. They all needed either at least another guitar player or a keyboard player because I, I love that sort of sound. And um, I thought this is the one song I've ever written that would actually work with a trio. And so in terms of a, a song, as far as songwriting goes, I'd point them in that direction. But... God, I don't know. As far as a solo goes, it's it's really tough. I don't know what I can say. I'd, I'd rather just send him in the direction of an album. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, like Big Sky. Um, yeah, God, it's it's really hard to know. Probably, I mean, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd love to draw more attention to the slide playing. The weirdest thing is that all th through my time with the Nelsons, I never played slide once with those guys, mm -hmm. which I can't quite figure out. Like it. You know, I did this open solo with them every night shredding and I thought, man, if I just chucked a slide on, I probably would have brought the house down. So, so, but, uh, I'd never even thought about it, but, uh, but, um, yeah, just, that's a tough one about a song. I really don't know. Okay. I think, yeah, Brothers is a great track. Um, and Big Sky is a great album. So I think that's a great place to, to point people. Um, last question. I call it Desert Island Gear. One guitar, one effects pedal, one amp and one record for your life stranded at sea. <laughs> what would you go oh, wow. for? Well, the amp would be the Bogner Ecstasy because uh, mm -hmm. I had to sell that to help finance the house I'm sitting in right now about nine years ago, unfortunately. But that was okay. I figured, well, they're still making them. So one of these days, uh, maybe I'll have enough money to buy another one. Um, but yeah, I'd love a Bogner Ecstasy again. It's got to have the matching 412 cab. It's... Uh, that's got to happen as well. Uh, the guitar, I, I'd probably take the old Strat. That's, mm -hmm. that's the one I've had since I was 13. So that's nearest and dearest to me. Um, wow, one pedal. That's interesting. Um, 
I'll take the XFX3. That's just got everything in it anyway. <laughs> that qualifies as a pedal. Yeah, good choice. I'll just, yeah, I'll take that. Um, and uh, and uh, one album. Wow, Jesus, that's a tough one. God. One album for the rest of my life. Yeah, maybe wow, get a versatile one, one you like to listen to, one you like to play along with. <laughs> Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. Great album. Yeah. yeah not the, not what I was expecting. <laughs> not at all. No, no. It's you would you would sort of think it'd be some sort of fusiony thing, but um, I, I, as far as if I was stuck on an island and I had to listen to something over and over and over again, I wish you were here is a great, yeah, <laughs> ironic yeah, choice. Yeah. Um, awesome. Just to wrap up, tell me about the future of your patron and what your your mission is over there. Um. Well, I just I just want to want to turn it into something that. Uh, that that I can keep going. I'd, I'd, I'm I'm seeing the absolute potential of it. Like I'm I'm thinking about like how I could just I could do a playthrough of one of my songs, and just getting through that as a challenge. They're they're tough tunes, you know. And I'd I'd want to do a full live playthrough and really really have it be a good version. They're bloody hard to do, but you could tear them apart and look at all the interesting things that happen in those songs, especially the stuff off Dark Matter. There was some really challenging stuff on that album mm. so you could explore sections rhythmically and things like that i sort of wanted to approach it from that angle but at the main the main core of it is it has to be of use to people but i think i think the thing i do honestly believe is that i've spent most of my playing life trying to come up with original stuff like that's why that's why you know if you put me in a lot of situations i am quite limited like you know, I'm not a I'm not a well versed country player or a jazz player or anything like that. But the one thing is, you get me to play some country, I won't play somebody else's licks. I'll, a lot of them will be my licks, and they will sound country, but they won't be that other guy's country. And uh, it's like the slide guitar thing. It's like it's like I, you know, that's the thing I really am most precious about is the slide playing because I really feel that is the one element of my style that you can't pinpoint the influences readily mm -hmm. um and uh and and that's that's where all the work has gone for me that's what saved me on some trivial funk like you could have put one of the greatest three note per string alternate pickers on that record and they would have been slaughtered by frank and sean no doubt about it the only thing that saved me on that album was the fact that i was not doing anything remotely like them or anything really remotely like anybody else it was just my own licks and no one had really heard those things until I played them on that record. So, so that's, that's where all my efforts gone. So, uh, that's what I want to try and present to access people access to on the Patreon site is access to years of hopefully original content, which can be changed and amalgamated into their own styles. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, I, I've missed it. I was nearly the first person to sign up. But you were I'll, second. <laughs> I was a second. Um, but I mean, just up, up to date to now, some great content um, covering a whole host of things from ear training, to ear training specifically for improvising, which is incredible. Um, your technique, actual licks from your recordings, that the mind blowing lick from Subway that we spoke about earlier, and um, your influences going. You, you've really got a whole package there of not just presenting information, but doing it alongside your experience as well which makes it so much more valuable you know talking about why this works well the information's everywhere isn't it you know i mean there's just guitar lesson upon guitar lesson all over the internet and people infinitely more qualified and more knowledgeable than me to present it that's for sure but yeah i just want to i want to present to people my unique experience just as a person just as because i'm a i'm the only one of me on the world in the world so it is unique to me but but uh yeah, this, I've, what I've found is so many people enjoy the stories. They just, and I've got billions of them because it's been a life well spent. It's been an incredible experience of being a musician, an incredibly positive one. And I, I like I said, I've, I've got nothing but horror stories from some of my friends about people I've worked for, and I have none of those. I've worked with I've John Farnham, Olivia Newton-John, and Paul Stanley. I did a short tour with Paul Stanley. Yep. They would be Barry Gibb. I did a gig with Barry Gibb. I mean, and there's other names as well, and they've all been absolutely wonderful. Like some of the nicest people I've ever met 
and some of the biggest stars. I mean, these are huge people that should have egos the size of freight trains, and it's just not there. So I want to really, I want to really, really let people know that, you know, a good time and good people still do exist out there, and and if they have a bad one, then they move on and find the good ones because they do exist. Awesome, fantastic, man! Thank you so much for your time and your insight and being so forthcoming with all that, uh, with, with all my questions, my nerdy little uh, fanboy questions. I appreciate that. Um, fantastic, dude. So. Everyone, I'll, I'll link to your Patreon down below, underneath. Highly recommend checking that out. Your music's out. We can check your website and find where to get that right. Um, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good on you, Luke. Thank <laughs> you, mate. And well done for, um, you know, with, withholding your dessert. It's sitting there in front of me. I'm just going to nuke it and I'm going to eat it and celebrate. So, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Well deserved. Thank you very much.